I apologize if I've lost my voice, so you'll have to bear with me. Um, I'd like to first thank Apurva Jairam and Navadisha Trinity Arts Festival for making me a part of this conversation. Can you hear me and understand me? Okay. Um, so the question posed to me is to redefine this term spiritual in the practice of Bharatanatyam today. And the specific questions posed to me are, what do we mean when we use this term spiritual? Um, is it, as Apurva said, merely jargon? Is it this feeling of ex exhilaration or achievement or discovery that we feel through performance? Or is it something beyond that? Um, and the second question posed is, what relevance does spirituality have in the lives that we as dancers lead today which are lives seemingly far removed from spirituality as was understood centuries ago. And I want to start by answering that second question to say that I don't think the understanding of spirituality changes. Life may change, society may change, science changes, technology changes, but the understanding of spirituality is the seeking of that which does not change, that which is unchanging, that which is eternal. And that's what makes it universal. That's what makes it irrespective of geography, nationality, age, time, century. And that's what makes it so pressing a search um, or a seeking. And the first question, how do we define spirituality in the context of Bharatanatyam? Um, first, have to define spirituality, which is a heavy content um, topic. But to put very simply, spirituality is, in essence, the process of transformation of consciousness from the finite to the infinite, from the constricted to the expansive, from the limited to the boundless. And um, all spiritual practices begin this process of transformation at the level of the mind. And so in dance, when we speak of dance being a meditation or dance being a yoga, we're actually talking about a sensitization or a transformation of our mind. Um, in or We'll take the word yoga, for example. The root of the word yoga is yuj, and yuj means to find a connection or a link. And so ultimately, in spirituality, it's finding the link from the smaller sense of self to the full, um, expansive, infinite sense of self. And in practices of meditation, you're given certain tools that help align these naturally scattered energies of the mind, help find alignment, help find harmony. Um, in meditation, you know, mantra, breath, vichar, spiritual inquiry, all of these things sort of align the thoughts and, um, and essentially, you know, form that bridge or form that link. And in dance, also, we have the tools. Um, there's the very basic shlokam, the sh simple shlokam that we learn, yato hasto tato drishti. And I think this speaks about the tools, where the hand goes, the eye goes, where the eye goes, the mind follows, where the mind follows, emotion goes, and where emotion goes, rasa is born. So this speaks of the um, moving from the tangible, from the physical, from the gross, for lack of better word, to then slowly the intangible, and the stacking, the aligning of those energies to find the harmony between the physical and the mental. In the training or the practice of the form, we start at the physical level. Um, you know, it's, it's very demanding, as we all know. Um, it utilizes every part of the body, from the limbs to the eyes to the neck to the fingers. And so when we start learning the form, um, we're, we're building that capacity for mindfulness, um, building that capacity to be completely in the experience of every movement. From the physical, from the technique, we move to abhinaya. Which, in which we learn to express, we move to the state of thought and emotion and channeling the energy in that um, even more subtle way. And as we go deeper and deeper in the form, we find um, even more subtle details, even finer nuances, punctuation, pauses, um, spaces in between. Um, I have my teacher sitting right here, and you know, the corrections that we might get when we're first starting is about arms and adamandi and footwork, which we continue to always get. But then now in class, um, I'm asked things like, 
you know, how does the material feel in your hands? Do you feel the heaviness? Do you feel the weight of the garland around your neck? And all of these things require an increased mindfulness. Um, so all of these tools sort of um, sensitize the mind, increase the capacity of the mind, and work towards this mindfulness um, of practice. Um, on the contrary, because there is so much going on physically, there's also a tendency for distraction. When you're sitting in meditation, your eyes are closed and you're at the level of the mind. If your mind goes astray, there's no dishonesty. You know that you know, you're not doing it mindfully. But in dance, because there is so much going on, it's very easy to let the mind go astray. And also because the practice requires sheer repetition um, and practice over and over in the mastery of the form, in the fluency um, you know, of the dance language, there's an increased tendency towards habituation. So we've all, you know, I'm sure, had the experience of doing a dance, maybe even doing it well, but the mind being completely somewhere else. Um, and so in that case, is it a spiritual practice? And um, I think the answer is no. So what makes this a spiritual practice is the living of it in every moment. And it's an ideal, obviously, that we, str or we are striving at, but it's not something that's guaranteed. So in that sense, it could be mere jargon. We can't just say, yes, it's a spiritual practice. Whether or not it's a spiritual practice depends on our intention and our, tension, our intention in every moment. So no matter the level of technical excellence that we've achieved or the number of years we've been doing it or the seniority or number of performances, it really matters from moment to moment what we invest in that moment, in that movement, in that character, in that gesture. And that, to me, is what gives the form the potential, the potential or the capacity to be a spiritual practice. Now, all of this being said, I know that there's a history that sort of um, lies ahead of what I'm saying in the sense dance was conceptualized as a form of yoga in the stances, the movement, um, and I'm not, I'm not qualified to speak on that, but I would like to mention that there are artists like Mandakini Trivedi who have done extensive research on the science behind the positions and the channeling of yogic energy in the body and its connection to the dancer's body and the cosm cosmos that we inhabit. Also the aharya or the costuming, everything has cosmic and spiritual significance. But today, in the passing on of the learning and the tradition, um, we don't so much get that knowledge or that information. It's more about the technique and the form. Um, so as a practitioner today, where it becomes a yogic or spiritual practice or has the potential is in the intention and is in the constant mindfulness. Um, a really nice image I like to think of is putting the thread through the eye of the needle. You know, that keen focus, that keen um, attention and effort towards alignment. So that's one thing. Uh, the next thing, which I think is undeniable, is content or exploration. Um, when it comes to Bharatanatyam, content is really what drives our choreography, our, expl our explorations. And we're given this wealth of myth, of iconography, and all of these things function at multiple levels, at the aesthetic level, at the symbolic level, and at the spiritual level. And everything, whether the stories that we dance about, whether the you know the deities or the gods who hold instruments or who who who, hold, who yield weapons, all of these details are actually symbolic of an inner experience that we contain within ourselves, and that's what makes the form so universal, so timeless. Um, but because these things are intangible, the content gives an outer expression to something that we experience in you know a colorful, beautiful. Um, visual, creative way. Um, sorry, where am I? <clears throat> and this sort of opens out this world of magic and beauty and um, depth. And I think that opens out the window that kind of goes back to ourselves. It opens out that window to beauty, magic, and depth that we contain within ourselves. And this is sort of the role that dance has always played in my life, even as a child. Um, you know, I grew up in a house that was just completely like concentrated with dance and music. My mom 
my teacher, Viji Prakash, you know, she's mad about dance. And so I grew up with like, just dance being like our life throbbing with dance. But what's interesting is I don't ever recall hearing the word spirituality or hearing the word sacred. Rather, I was introduced to stories and characters um, through books, through reading, through watching, through productions, through playing characters, um, you know, characters like Mirabai, like Tulsidas, like, um, you know, poetry of Tagore, of Sufi saints, of Jain poets. And all of this kind of created this magical world in me. Um, through them, I, I learned what is bhakti, what is surrender, what is beauty, what is depth. And I learned to experience that in a sense within myself. And it filled me with this like desire for more. And, um, and it was a world that was kind of magical and separate from everyday life, from the mundane, from going to school, you know, friends and things like that. It wasn't something that I could speak about, but through dance I could express it. And <clears throat> that's something, you know, as a child I felt, and it continues today. So content makes a difference. Even today when you dance about you know, Mira or an Andal or Akka Mahadevi or, or even pieces on Krishna and Shiva and Devi. These were my idols growing up. And, and so when you do work of that, you know, that pitch, like for example, when I worked on, on a piece on Akka Mahadevi, just the sheer like passion and fervor and depth of her words and her work, just you're like reverberating with that energy and it's absolutely transformative. Um, so, yeah, in, in sort of conclusion, to me it's these two aspects. One is the practice and the training and the intention, and the other is the content and the, the exploration. And that too is about intention. You know, we can, we can explore anything with Bharatanatyam, but um, we have the capacity to tap into the spiritual. Um, one thing that I... Let me check the timing. Okay, I don't know where the timing has gone. But one thing that I want to address that I think is really important is um, this dichotomy that I think we feel, or that I feel at least, in that if dance is this practice where we're working on alignment, we're working on centering, we're working on harnessing these energies, um, but at the same time we're doing it on a stage, we're doing it in front of people, vulnerable and you're, well you're not vulnerable, but you're, you're within yourself and there's nobody outside to judge you or watch you, but when you're in performance, thank you. When you're, when you're in performance, you are putting yourself out there in a sense. And, um, and like Malaka was saying, there are different trends in the way that dance is being watched, the way dance is being commented on, the expectations that people come in with when they watch dance. And um, it's, I, I mean, I don't even have an answer or question as such, but just this dichotomy that I feel um, at you know, kind of keeping that center, but also knowing that we're on a public platform sharing this. And another thing is the issue of social media. Now there's an increased pressure, you know, people are like, you're a dancer, post rehearsal videos, um, you know, we want to see in process stuff, we, you know, and you see people taking selfies of themselves saying, you know, moments of deep contemplation, and then you see a photo. And what does this mean? I mean, are, is, it, is it taking away from, from our, you know, inner processes and our seriousness and our focus, um, and how do we kind of negotiate these outward pulls and the inward pull that is required in the practice of a form such as this? Um, I think that's where I would leave it at. Thank you for listening to me. Mm -hmm.